Street, US Route 1 is that yellow line going from the bottom left to the upper right. You guys all know this. This oh, yeah. is Route 1 looking southbound. This is Route 1 looking northbound. And this is looking up Union Street with, with a stop and go there on the right. What Maine DOT has been long concerned about and, and feels is probably one of the biggest challenges of this intersection is the stop sign that's facing people who are heading north. Uh, it's, it's one of the few instances where the major road, US Route 1, actually yields to a minor roadway, which would be Union Street. Uh, Union Street has a much smaller uh, amount of traffic on it compared to Route 1. And there's long been some concerns within Maine DOT about how that impacts traffic flow. So here on the left-hand side, you can see based upon uh, the counts we have, you know, we estimate uh, that north of the intersection, there's on average over the course of the whole year, over 12,000 vehicles that are north of the intersection. Mm -hmm. South of the intersection, there's close to uh, closing in on 11,000 vehicles. And then Union Street only has about 4,200. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see the turning movements. So if you're coming south on Route 1, You'll see um, this is the estimated peak hour activity. So this is peak hour in the afternoon. You can see that going southbound on one, approximately 184 vehicles will turn on to Union Street. Well, 462 will go straight through. Heading north on Route 1, 466 will go straight through with 53 turning on Union Street. And right here, if you're on Union Street you, and you decide to go south on one, we estimate 95 vehicles and coming off Union Street going north, 204. So we use those traffic volumes and those turning movements to do an analysis. Part of that analysis is looking at the crash history. So this is the crash history for the last 10 years, from 2011 through 2020. Um, what you'll notice is there's a whole lot of these turning movements where, where they're coming in contact with a, another vehicle. Mm -hmm. These are all instances where vehicles failed to yield the right of way. In this case here, coming off Union Street, they had the right of way and they were struck by vehicles who were going northbound. Mm. Here, you have vehicles who were going southbound who were struck by vehicles coming off Union Street. And then for the folks who are heading north, we've got some rear ends, we've got some turning movement things. We have multiple, we've got uh, one, two, three multiple vehicle rear end situations, as well as some yielding problems. So what we really want to try and do is how can we make things better at this intersection? Uh, you know, is this something we should look at if, you know, closer? Does it address safety issues? How does it impact mobility and, and vehicle movement through there? What's the impact on adjacent properties? That's that right of way column. And then is it a cost effective approach? As we look at this, safety is at the core of our analysis and trying to uh, recognize that there may be minor changes in safety that give us uh, dramatic changes in um, the capacity of the roadway to move vehicles through, as well as our ability to provide uh, access for other roadway users beside just the motor vehicles. So what we're going to do is take a look at, at the different alternatives mm -hmm. that were out there. What you can see here is one of the alternatives that was explored was moving the stop from Route 1 northbound 
to making it a Union Street stop. What I want to point out before we delve into this too deep is based upon our studies, the existing condition is the worst case scenario for us. Uh, we have the worst um, traffic volume through the intersection. We have the greatest wait times overall for vehicles and the greatest impact uh, to, uh, to traffic through the town of Camden. So by changing it to a Union Street stop, overall we're getting a, uh, a market improvement in traffic. What we do see here is the greens are positive, the reds are negatives. We do see that people who are on Union Street do have a marked increase in their wait time. It changes from 3.3 seconds to 84 seconds. So that's a pretty big jump. We also see that because we'll no longer have that free flowing traffic on Union Street, the wait, the queue, the wait time changes from 84 feet to 504 feet. We also notice that the southbound Route 1 queue, so the, the folks coming to this intersection from the right, that queue length goes from 33 feet to 150 feet. So there are some negatives here. However, northbound Route 1 goes from 844 feet down to three feet. And northbound Route 1, the, the turning lane queue, drops from 320 feet to eight feet. So what we see is a decrease uh, in the throughput of vehicles on Union Street, a dramatic increase for those who are going northbound on Route 1, and a slight decrease in the capacity for vehicles mm -hmm. that are southbound on 1. Mm -hmm. One of the other alternatives we looked at was making it an all-way stop. So all three legs would come upon a stop sign and take their turns on moving. Even with everybody stopping and taking their turns, we still saw an improvement in traffic. We actually saw that Union Street traffic flow improves from the current conditions. We do see a decrease in that southbound Route 1 traffic flow because they have pretty much free movement right now. Northbound Route 1 traffic improves. Union Street, the typical queue is only about 102 feet. So that's about four vehicles. Southbound Route 1 typical queue ends up being about 355 feet. The northbound Route 1 Q is about 200 feet, so about halfway between those. And northbound Route 1 right turn is only about 70 feet. We also looked at what would happen at this intersection if we eliminated that dedicated right turn lane and we made it a single northbound Route 1 lane. Overall, there was just a very slight decrease in the overall traffic impact and the, and the impact on drivers. We, we do see that this lane removal, that dedicated right turn lane, does give us some shoulder space that could be used for bicycle lanes or sidewalk installation right by the stop and go. We think that with that increased space, we would see improved bicycle and pedestrian safety. We do notice that the northbound Route 1 traffic delay would increase just slightly from 18.3 seconds to 18.7 seconds. And the northbound traffic queue length would only increase about 46 feet. So about two car lengths. So that's the, the, if we chose to make it an always stop and eliminate that dedicated right turn lane. If we wanted to look at putting a signal in, um, we see a substantial overall traffic improvement, greater efficiency through the intersection. 
by installing a traffic signal that's properly timed, we estimate that the average delay per vehicle would only be about 14.2 seconds. Union Street would be the one who would be impacted the most. They have a slightly increased delay in their wait time. We see improvements to the Route 1 traffic flow. We see a substantial improvement uh, exponentially, about almost 10 times uh, the northbound traffic flow. The queue for Union Street's 175, southbound's 369. The through lane for Route 1 North is 162. And if you're looking at that turning lane, that's only about 37 feet. Mm -hmm. If we take that same signal um, and we only have a single lane in both directions, so we've got one lane northbound, one lane southbound, there's no dedicated turn, left turn lane, there's no dedicated right turn lane. Based upon current conditions, we still see a substantial increase in traffic um, flow through the area. The delay per vehicle actually goes down compared to the previous. Once again, Union Street has a slight delay compared to current conditions. Southbound North One, northbound traffic flow increases and improves on Route One. Union Street has a slightly longer wait, but it's not substantial. And the queue lengths aren't terrible um, for, for southbound as well, or northbound, southbound or northbound. Mm -hmm. If we put in the turn signal with a southbound left turn pocket, so if you're coming to the intersection from the north and want to make a left turn onto Union, we still see huge improvements in traffic flow. The vehicle delay average isn't that much different. Union Street still has that slight delay that we saw before. Southbound Route 1 traffic flow improves. There is a substantial improvement in the northbound traffic flow. The Union Street queuing actually shortens up compared to the previous one where we only had the single lane Northbound queue isn't, isn't substantially different. Uh, the big thing we see here is that southbound Route 1 left turn lane would only be queuing up to be about 103 feet. So that's four to five vehicles. Everybody, I hear this every time I come to town. Everybody wants to know, what about a roundabout? What about a roundabout? <laughs> Based upon you know, um, design standards. If you have a typical semi-trailer going up Route 1, traditionally that semi-trailer of average length would need between 100 and 130 foot turning radius mm -hmm. to go through this roundabout. Mm -hmm. This inner circle is the 100 uh, diameter for the turning radius, the outside red circle would be that 130 foot. So somewhere in here is the amount of space you would need in order to put a single lane roundabout on Route 1 to connect those three roads. Here's where it gets kind of nasty. There are enormous design challenges that have to be overcome in order to put this in. Um, there's uh, grades and slopes uh, between uh, coming downhill as you're heading north, heading uphill from the south, and then coming in from Union Street. We also know, and you can look here and see the type of impacts that there would be uh, to adjacent property owners, mm -hmm. property owners that have historical significance. Mm -hmm. We think that at this intersection, we would anticipate at least three, if not four property impacts. We do think that there would likely have to be at least one building removed. And this alternative is easily the most expensive. 
the advantage to this is we would likely see the biggest reduction in the number of crashes at this at this intersection. We also think it would generate the greatest improvement to traffic flow. Union Street, once again, because Union Street currently has a free flowing condition, they're the only one that would experience uh, a greater delay than, than the current conditions. That's only about 50 feet. Northbound, 75, southbound, 100 feet. Overall, that would be about 9.7 seconds delay for each vehicle entering the roundabout. Mm -hmm. It's a ton of information. I know that. And, it, and that's why I think it'll be helpful when I get you the report and, right. and the presentation so you can look at it a little bit deeper. Looking at Union Street as having the one-way stop, it's gonna be the least costly alternative. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> However, it also gives the lowest benefit to, to all the alternatives we explored. This alternative could allow for the, elim the elimination of the northbound right turn lane, which once again, would give us that opportunity to add facilities that could be used by either bicycles or the installation of a sidewalk. If we go to the all-way stop with the existing configuration, it's really a very low cost alternative. It provides significant benefit to both mobility and safety. So we're moving more vehicles through more efficiently and it increases safety, we should see a reduction in the number of crashes. However, that does not address that northbound right turn lane width uh, for bike and ped accommodation. That was one of the things folks wanted us to look at. An always stop with a single lane on the northbound approach, again, low cost lower mobility benefits for those on Route 1, hmm. it would allow for that reestablishment of bike and ped facilities at the intersection. If we want to talk about the a signal at this location, it offers improved mobility and the potential for improved pedestrian access throughout the intersection. The opportunity to put in uh, crosswalks at the intersection to tie Union Street um, to the other side of Route 1. It's less expensive than a roundabout, but it's still one of the more expensive alternatives. It's the second most expensive. Just because of it being a signal and motorist behaviors, we would anticipate a slight um, decrease in safety at the intersection, but they tended to be minor crashes uh, that were property damage only. We saw signalizing this intersection with the consolidation of the northbound through and right turn lanes and implementing a southbound left turn lane would give us that shoulder for the bike ped element. And signalizing the intersection, as I said, is the second most expensive alternative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The roundabout gives you the greatest mobility and safety benefits. You move the greatest number of vehicles through most efficiently. Nice. And it also does uh, provide the greatest uh, reduction in crashes. It has substantially greater cost it would require rebuilding everything at that intersection. So it would be a substantial undertaking. It does require uh, substantial right-of-way acquisition. We do feel that's one of the buildings at that intersection and maybe some of the vegetation, some of the trees would likely need to be removed. And the cost at this location would likely exceed any of the benefits that we would see from either mobility or safety benefits. Interesting questions. So questions. Mm -hmm. From main DOT's perspective, 
our preferred alternative based <laughs> on the information that's provided would be the signalized intersection. Right. We feel right. it gives us the greatest return with the least uh, negative benefits, only minimal safety impacts, but substantial improvements for all three legs right. of the roadway uh, to be able to um, improve traffic flow. And it also does provide uh, improved connectivity and safety for bikes and pets through the area. Um, questions before, yeah, before we get into questions, I want to go back to, because you know, there's just a lot of data here, a lot of information, but um, you mentioned the report. Does the report it have a lot more data in it than you just presented in terms of a, a traffic, you know, studies, numbers, uh, and the kind of backup for some of the statistics? I, I tried to pare it down so you had the most relevant salient points, but there is more data in there that I did not include. I don't know if that's a good answer for you or a bad answer. Well, for no, you. I'm just trying to before you get, we want to ask I mean, a lot of questions because there's, there's a lot of, of data, but I, I didn't know what was in this forthcoming report uh, from MDOT uh, because a lot of my questions are, well, the technical questions regarding, you know, what, what time of year the, the data was t taken in terms of backups and that kind of thing is very important, obviously, to us. Um, for the various options, uh, you know, uh, traffic like configurations and time, uh, 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 the time, um, the timing of lights uh, it, that makes a huge difference. And you know, you you know all this, and that's the questions that that uh, they're, they're highly technical, but they matter significantly because one of the major effects that occurs here in Camden, though those live here, is a couple of things. One is um, the amoeba effect. And what I, what I call, I know when stuff is backing up and going southbound, and where, where do we and others go? We go through neighborhoods to make take shortcuts. And we get, I get a lot of comments from a lot of people that said, in the summer, the traffic through my small, they consider, you know, neighborhood increases dramatically. Um, so I'd be really cautious to evaluate their options from that perspective. The other one that surprised me a little bit was, um, safety-wise, that we mentioned 22 crashes in nine years, that's three and a half crashes a year. Honestly, that's nothing. That's, that's, that's minor. That's usually minor. Route 1 North has had the same number of accidents per year on average for, the, for 15 years. I, was, I would have expected more because I think it's a very awkward intersection. And people, I think most out-of-state people almost hit me every time I'm coming up Union Street. But I think anybody who's driven through the intersection more than a few times knows how many close calls there are right. as well. And, and the last thing just- And none of that gets recorded. And, and open up to board discussion, but now what are the next steps from MDOT's perspective in terms of this potential project? So Maine DOT approached the town several years ago with an offer to install a traffic signal at this intersection. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, the, the town was not interested in moving forward with that. But I think more recently there have been some, some changes in um, the awareness of how, how much the community would like to improve the bikeability and walkability through this intersection. And there was a, a sense that maybe the town was more willing to to consider this alternative at this point in time. Mm -hmm. When I had a conversation with leadership in DOT, DOT is willing to move forward with this project, but we do not want to be, uh, what's what I'm looking for? <laughs> we, we, we are not looking at this as a mandate right. for the municipality. Uh, understood. We, and, and Audra and, and Dave know me well enough to know, we want to be partners in this process sure. with the town. We do truly believe that this would be an improvement in many ways for many different aspects through that intersection. But main DOT is awaiting 
confirmation of support from the leadership in the town. Yeah, got it. What I have what I have been asked for is if you would like to see one of these alternatives implemented, DOT would like to have a formal letter of request from the town to move forward with that alternative, as opposed to us making a decision and just moving forward, whether it was something you agreed with or not. Well, clearly, as I said, there's a lot, a lot of data here and a lot of questions. It's probably where, and can't all. I don't think they'll be all answered tonight because some of them are very technical. I, so I you know, had I, no intention <laughs> of tonight being. I didn't. End I, point. I didn't think you did, Patrick. I wasn't uh, alleging that you would even try that. But in the meantime, we do have your attention, so we will ask some generic, general questions about the options mm -hmm. while we have your, your attention. So, Allison, you have your hand up first. Um, yeah. So this is. On the Pathways Committee, we've talked about this a lot, and I heard it come up at those pedestrian safety forums, and I've heard over the years lots of people saying, well, if they just did this, if they just did this, and um, in terms of you know, the main goal, um, I think for a lot of these people would be making it possible to walk to stop and go, um, which is a destination a lot of people need to get to, and then mm -hmm. cross the road um, or get, you know, have that sidewalk go all the way down to stop and go. Um, would you say that um, having, you know, adding in a crosswalk or a sidewalk there, is that, are any of the, all those things impossible with the current? configuration? Do we have to do something different in order to accomplish that? Can, can I sort of, um, before Patrick answers that, yeah. um, one of the sort of the bigger problems that we have is that if you're in a wheelchair or you mobility impairments or whatever the case may be, you can't walk all the way from downtown Camden to like the Rennie's Plaza or yeah, even on either side right there's something yeah because of the steps and the tree oh, right, on one right. side and on the other side it just it's not a real sidewalk it's just correct space that's been claimed and paved but there's so many utility poles in the way that it, it doesn't provide enough space so right. you know this this sort of um, renewed focus on that intersection really came from you know, us working with Patrick and his colleagues to really try to figure out a solution with that intersection. And we were looking at it configured as it is now, and there just isn't, right. there's just isn't a way to do it if we were to keep it exactly as it is now. So that's why, that's one of the reasons why they sort of revisited, um, you know, old um, plans or old studies sure. and updated it to try to figure sure. out what are what are alternatives to how it's configured now and what are the benefits and drawbacks of well, each? That's, I mean, that's, that feeds to the core of the study because if you did consider a traffic signalization of any kind and you could consider pedestrian crossing, you're going to have longer wait times at a traffic light for a person to be able to cross. And that, I don't, I don't know if that data I, I don't. I didn't see anything where that data has been included in this study. I, I, I'm presuming that. Like, are we trying to make it safer for? I'm not all that worried about how safe it is for vehicles right now. Like, what was? What's our main goal? Is it to make it safer for pedestrians? Is it to make it safer for vehicles? I think that's what we have to kind of. Well, and that's on. why Patrick is the one presenting because he's the multimodal program coordinator. Right. So he, right. yeah, he can answer a lot of those questions about the pedestrian and cyclist. Sophie, go ahead. Facilities and safety. So. So piggybacking on, on what you're just saying, Alison, uh, it strikes me that different solutions uh, tend to benefit, I mean, th there, there's, there's more benefits from moving the traffic faster on Route 1 than there are benefits to pedestrian safety um, in terms of cost-benefit analysis as in what you presented us. Like the, 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 the goal is really to move traffic faster on Route 1. Correct. Not faster, well, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. But so to, to reduce the amount of wait time. That, right, that, but that, at that the has. cost of, of increasing the wait time on Union Street or pedestrian and bike safety. I, uh, pretty much. Mm, pretty I much. I think so, because some of the alternatives that are presented. Ultimately, the biggest thing that's a barrier right now for for pedestrian access is that dedicated right turn lane 
on the northbound leg for sure. people to turn onto Union Street. There's not enough space between the curb line and the stop and go to have one lane going southbound, one through lane going northbound, and then that one dedicated right turn lane. Uh, some of that space would be utilized by a sidewalk and or a, a bike lane. But, but I think, I mean, to my, the point I'm trying to make is we need to decide what is the priority number one that we want to achieve, or as Alison was saying, what is our goal with this intersection? Is it to move traffic faster on Route 1? Is it to increase bikeability, walkability, safety? Is it to slow down traffic? I mean, there is virtue in slowing down traffic, especially in a resort town with a lot of people walking around. Increasing speed of traffic is not necessarily something we want to do. So. The point I'm trying to make is who makes that decision? How do, you, do we prioritize the goal we want to achieve by redesigning this intersection? And is it a, is it a joint discussion with M oh. M main DOT? Is it, is it a, a workshop at the select board? How do we make that decision? I mean, he's the pedestrian safety person, so he has been pretty, he yeah, usually does advocate for that. And I would so. say that when we, you know, like, like I was saying before, when we originally approached this, it was from a bicycle pedestrian right. safety right. perspective. Right. And I think, you know, one of the things that wasn't picked up in this, but I think if you go into the data a little bit more and maybe if you had sort of a traffic engineer who, you know, did this kind of explaining some of it, there's also a lot of weird motorist behavior at that intersection yeah, where yeah, people I'm, are sort of punching I, out. And that makes it difficult if you want to create a crosswalk for people to go from one side of the road to the other to do it safely because, you know, people who are stopped and waiting right. are always looking for that opportunity when people aren't coming in and out of Union Street. So I think I, they're trying, you know, this would, Patrick didn't necessarily talk, say, you know, speak to it when he was talking about the counts and, and who moves more efficiently, but I think that's an important part of all this is the, the behavior and allowing pedestrians, right. pedestrians and cyclists to be able to cross without, right. Right. you know, the, right. that right. sort of behavior right. you get from the way it's configured now. I, I completely get it. I, I, I 100% happy to redesign this thing and this intersection. I think so. It's an awful intersection for for plenty of reasons that that were highlighted. But my concern is that, I mean, I look at traffic lights and there's like. I, Patrick, I have such a long laundry list of things that I dislike about, <laughs> about traffic lights that I won't bore you. I mean, my preference has always been roundabouts. I come from, you know, I'm European in Europe. We favor roundabouts as everywhere as much as we can for a host of reasons. And um, I think I, I want to dig into the data, but I also want to understand the process on how we're going to make that decision. Right. I think... I agree with, with Audra and, and Allison both. I think this conversation, the genesis of this conversation really came about through the pedestrian safety forums and our conversations about how to make it safer to get around town. That connected, that connectivity out to, to Hannaford, the connectivity mm -hmm. to, Query here um, to, yeah. to stop and go, the, the connectivity from one side of Route 1 to the other side. You know, that's really important to me. And the way the intersection is currently laid out with with the stop sign where it is and the way traffic flows, there is no good place on any leg of that intersection for a pedestrian to cross mm -hmm. any of those roads. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the safest place we could identify is is just north of the intersection where the existing crosswalk At, at Free Street. Is. When you go south... It's, it's still pretty scraggly where the crossing is. That's not a great crossing a great either. Place. So There's one right before it too, like but. so to you know to do some type of improvement here that would give pedestrians access 
to all four corners of that intersection would be huge for improving your connectivity. Yep. Yeah. And so part of that, I think, is is eliminating that dedicated right turn lane in order to get that yep. space. Yep. Patrick, is a incremental approach uh, potentially beneficial? My first thought is um, put the stop sign on Union Street, uh, spin the flashing beacon, uh, and you have a significant intersection improvement there for virtually no cost. It does uh, allow you to eliminate the right turn lane on the northbound. Um, see how that works. If it doesn't do the purpose that we it would like or intend, you know, prioritized, um, then then look at signals. It's an option. I think I think that's a decision that. If, if that's the way the board would like to proceed, that's an alternative mm -hmm. that's, that's put forward here. Once again, for each of these, there are advantages and disadvantages. And, you know, I, I have to agree with you, it's easily the cheapest solution. One of the questions that I have as the non-engineer is, and I don't live in town, how much of the traffic that's on Union Street that we experience right now is derived from the fact that it has the current traffic flow that it does? How many people who live in the Camden area yep. Yep. heading south on Route 1 make that left onto Union Street because they know but they have yeah. five times a day. They have a free turn, yep. and you know how to get from Union Street to wherever you're going. Well, it goes further than that, Patrick, because we put the other it goes the other way too. We we we, we, we reroute ourselves to Union Street to take a right on right. Route One, so you don't have to well, stop. Exactly. You didn't get me. A, you didn't give me a chance to get that. Sorry. <laughs> but those poor people who are the tourists. Yep. who are the, the economic lifeblood of our community are now stuck at that stop sign heading northbound on Route 1. And one of the concerns, and this goes back to one of the things Audra said, think about driver behavior when people get frustrated about having to wait. Yep, yep. That's when people start making bad decisions sure. and choices that put pedestrians, bicyclists, other drivers at risk. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but we shouldn't the... design for, for, I mean, we have to stop designing for cars. That's, that's basically, you know, well, yeah, but we, also, we have to take them into account, but they, well, can know, but they cannot be like the number one priority. We have to shift the paradigm here because yeah. it's, it's... To a point, to a point. Yeah, we, to a point, we but a, we cannot accommodate... We have now in the summer a, a better part of a mile back up on Route 1 South for every, every day and trying to get through. And my biggest concern would be also the fact that we, if we start causing a backup at, at Union Street for some reason, it's going to back up all the way through Camden, and then your amoeba situation is going to get 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. So you need a bypass. Mm. Well, well, hold on, won't they? Oh, why would it back up all the way on Union Street? Because won't people choose? No, uh, I don't know. But um, Stockton either. Springs. But I, I think there are, there, there are, right. it, this is a lot of data in a short time. And Patrick, you know that. You uh, gave me 15 minutes. I did the best I could. You did a phenomenal <laughs> job. You did a phenomenal yes. job. He, uh, you know, it had nothing to do with the presentation. It's, it's got to do with all the work that's been done. It's a lot, a lot more than I have anticipated and, and saw a lot of good data in there. And I want to absorb it and, and try to. Me back. five hours to break the report down to give you that five presentation. Five hours, wow. But we need, we, obviously, thanks for sending the report. That's imperative. I think we have to have that. But then we have to figure out to Sophie's point how we noodle, how we work that to discuss the alternatives, everything from a, uh, a sequential approach, as Tom's suggesting, right. to something more dramatic. And what I recommend is I, I agree that I think. This is my personal opinion. I'm not trying to sway anybody. Right. I think the determination of whether or not 
you want to add pedestrian facilities at this intersection is the first question to ask yourself an answer. Yep. If you answer yes, that eliminates some of the alternatives. Yep. If you say no, then you have a different set of alternatives to choose from. Right. And then you need to look at, quite honestly, tear the presentation apart and look at the pages side by side. Exactly. And compare the numbers yep. that you see. Yep, I agree. Stephanie, any comments? No, I really need to look at. Um, I'm, the, I'm in the same place you. I need to. I need to side by side. Too. There's just too much information to absorb. It's wonderful, much more than I expected. By the way, I, I really think it was quite well done. I, and from that, questions will evolve. If I, what I can do tonight is email Audra the report. And a PDF of the PowerPoint, so you yep. could get digital copies. Yep. And since I already have them printed, I'll drop the printed copies in the mail tomorrow. Perfect. If I mail it tomorrow, maybe you'll have it by Friday. Probably. I've given up trying to predict the U.S. Yeah, post office. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> but that would be great. That's it's just a, what a lot of great information that you want. It really is. And we'll have, we'll have to figure out amongst us boys and girls how we funnel it to a to a to a to a focal point so we can decide good and bad and ugly. Yeah, and I mean, in, yeah. Patrick, you didn't mention. <laughs> so, Patrick, you didn't mention the other option that initially that I think Dave Allen suggested or was willing to offer up and that was us taking that the best case scenario a step below the roundabout which was a signalized signalization of that intersection in a temporary oh. way oh so that and then an evaluation of it after it was in place yeah. for a while yeah. i think that was yeah. really something we had discussed that really didn't come up in this. I, I don't mean. I, maybe you left it out on purpose, but um, <laughs> did Dave? Uh, sorry, you aren't going to get away with I it. Wanted to talk about. You're not going to get away with it. You, so we. <laughs> you, that was one of the things we had talked about because, you know, then there's like it's a at least a trial type of basis. It takes the best case scenario. It signalizes it. I know it was a little bit more expensive for you to do it that way, but that would give everybody. A, the opportunity to kind of change their mind, I think, if they found that uh, basically, the it's data ba was it's basically experimental. It was an experiment. So I just want to throw that out there. Yes. I didn't know where that went, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Dave, yeah. thank we you. We explored the option of doing a demonstration there, and the challenge we found was how big the intersection is how big the corners are because of turning traffic. Oh. They don't make temporary equipment that would allow us to do an honest to goodness, you know, demonstration of how this would work. Mm -hmm. We would have to cobble together a, uh, it would probably be like a half installation of a full fledged piece. Mm -hmm. It would require sinking poles in on the corners and then running span wire across mm -hmm. the intersection in order to, excuse me, to get the lights positioned correctly over the lanes that they're, they're guiding. Yep. Um, just really we, quick. quick yeah, go ahead, we should explore it. Um, so is there, in terms of proceeding with digesting this information, it seemed like a big factor is whether or not we would be interested in pedo the pedestrian crossing improvements and the sidewalk stuff. Does it, do we need to, the way you outlined those options, kind of going back to what Bob's question was, um, if you add in the estimated wait times and pros and cons of each option and, and say, okay, this is what we know it would be if we were to do the crosswalks, I kind of, have a sense that the majority of us aren't interested in doing this if we don't make pedestrian safety improvements, that the idea I, I, would be I, to do I, it with I, that. I don't want to make any decisions about anything, Tom. I'm not ready to make any statements about anything. I'm just, this is the first time I've been exposed to this ever. 
in the town of Camden, and I want to think about it and play with it and look at the report. So I, I, I'm not committing to anything. Okay, but if we were to say, if we're then maybe, do we need to separate it out by these are the criteria or these are the pros and cons in a mm -hmm. in under this scenario, depending yep. on the goals. Yep. And if the goal is yep. pedestrian connectivity, then you exactly. have to look at it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yep. Because that's an. I mean. Yep. I agree. I agree. I was not, once again, I'm not the engineer. I wasn't <laughs> there for the calculations. I do not anticipate that the adding of crosswalks would substantially change wait times or or the overall traffic flow through this intersection. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not based New York on City. Timing. It's like... And, but I do see a dramatic increase in the safety for pedestrians going mm -hmm. through this intersection. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, yeah. one of the other elements that I didn't mention is um, we also may have the option of incorporating intelligent signalization at this intersection it's responsive, it's dynamic. So we're putting that in at more and more locations. Like with Cassid. What I mean by it being dynamic and responsive, I'm probably not the only one who's here tonight who hates sitting at a red light when you don't see any cars anywhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. These, this intelligent transportation system actually evaluates traffic flows and modifies the signalization timing to maximize uh, the efficiency of vehicle movements through the intersection. Right. So you're not sitting there uh, at a red light when nobody's coming through the intersection the right. other ways. You'd end up getting a green signal. That's, so traffic that's, the Wiscas traffic. that's the Wiscasset model. I believe so, yes. Is. Okay, good. Um, boy, lots to, lots to chew on, Patrick. Great job. Um, so here's what I can put on the table. I heard somebody mention it earlier. I realize that this is a lot of information. And quite honestly, I had to see it and look at it and turn pages yep. for me to understand it. I really don't, nothing against you. I don't expect anybody to have really fully comprehended what I was saying right. until you have a chance to read it and look at it deeper. Somebody had mentioned the possibility of a workshop yep. and or a workshop session. You know, I could make myself available I can see if the region engineer would be available. Unfortunately, the young lady who who generated this report is out on maternity leave, so she's going to be out for a little while longer. I don't know when her return to the office is. Okay. So I can't offer her up for those specific questions. Okay. But we could plan a working session if you were interested to delve into this a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's a, that sounds good, Patrick. I mean, in the, between now and that point, we, we've got to get some of our act, act together in terms of objectives and that kind of, we may have to have one just a moment. Well, we have to work on that, but first and foremost, we hope to get this week, latest Monday, the reports and information so we can start chewing on it. Then, we have to, then, we'll, then we'll have to have, we have a, a, a responsibility to, uh, to f uh, focus and fill filter whatever information we may want to be asking so it doesn't become a, you know, a, a one size fits all kind of meeting. So one of the things I haven't mentioned, and to be honest, I haven't necessarily been authorized to say it, <laughs> but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, Maine DOT is look at, would be looking at doing these improvements with no local cost share. Okay. Now, if you want to 
to contribute to the project. We're willing to let you. Of course. But I do not anticipate that that would be a requirement. Okay, we'll, we'll let you know on that one. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. We're gonna have to uh, move on, but this has been great. Um, uh, it Thank was a you. lot of information. Thank you. Thank you. This is not the, obviously the last time we'll be talking. Thank you, sir. Good. Thank you, and we'll look forward to Glad seeing to the help. reports. Thank you very Thank you. much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. You too. Have a wonderful evening yourself. Now that we took up all of his evening. Bye, Patrick. Um, bye, all. Bye, all. Um, let's we'll go on to our last agenda item, which is select board reports. And I'll start with Stephanie. Do you have anything you'd like to report, Stephanie? Are we going to do the, the carry, carry over? Oh, sorry. Carry yeah, Audrey, you didn't slap me around about the carry forward. Sorry, forwards. I didn't. Okay, I let's start off. Thank you, thank you. But the carry forward, Audrey, maybe a little brief intro to remind us and, and to, uh, if there are questions of uh, our new members, what the carry forward thing is that we do every year, what it is. Yep, so at the, um, at the end of each financial year, so around you know, this time we have a good idea of um, you know, where the, the budget from FY22 is, is sitting and you know, what um, line items still have funds available in them and whether or not that's going to be useful for the upcoming year. Um, if that money isn't carried forward uh, and the select board makes the decision on what gets carried forward and what doesn't, it lapses into the surplus or what we call the unassigned fund balance. So the carry forwards really just give um, you know, department heads and the select board an opportunity to um, you know, look at what we have left and if there's a, a project that we weren't able to expend all the funds on um, for that financial year, we can carry forward into the next financial year. Mm -hmm. uh, we do it very commonly with, um, you know, the capital improvement projects because often those span a number of years, uh, but it can also be with, you know, more operational items. Um, you know, it, it could be, um, you know, that we know that we're going to be spending a lot more money in the upcoming year on, um, like, a, the records preservation project that's Mm -hmm. You know, an, an example of something where we might not have been able to spend down that money in FY22, but we have a plan for FY23 for how we're going to use it. So that's the, the purpose of the carry forwards. Um, we've traditionally carried forward quite a bit of money in the departments, and one of the things that we're trying to do instead of carrying forward these line items into the operational budget if there's an appropriate reserve account that we can carry them forward into and it makes sense to do so, we'll do, we'll do that instead or we'll recommend to do that instead. Yeah, I think the, the, the difference there, so you all know, it, it is, is rather than carrying the, the specific amount of money forward in that budget account, it's put in a, a bucket of reserve. So if you want to use it for that department during the year, you take it out of that reserve total bucket for its use. This is most often done when you, when you've had carry forwards every year of the same amount, which means you're not using it. So if you're not using it, why, why put the tag on it as a, as a, as a budget item and just put it in the reserve? Or some things. You know, there's a lot of money that we allow to lapse into surplus because that's a more appropriate place for it. But right. these are the areas where um, you know the department heads have identified that it's. Um, appropriate to carry it forward into FY23. Right. And, and, and I would point out that most of the carry forwards, as you can see, the bulk of the money is in capital projects. Uh, that's where it is, what, 1.2 million total of, uh, I think, carry forward well, that needs to be considered. But most of that money is, is, in, the, is in capital projects that are listed here. I'm trying to get to it, but like fingering through a thousand. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. I'm going to get there in about three years. I know. Jeez, Audra, could you explain, just so I fully understand? Um, sure. So, I'm looking, for instance, at uh, out uh, culture and recreation. I'm just going to pick any mm -hmm. summer rec program. Um, we have the option of carrying forward $13,190 from fiscal year 22 to 23. And if we choose not to, that would go into a different uh, fund for the town that's more f for broader use. Yes, yeah, so it would just lapse into the surplus. Okay. Or the and the surplus is still available uh, for you or other. No. Oh, so the, the, no. 
tricky part with it lapsing into surplus is once it's there, it can only be used by a vote of town meeting, and that's usually done during the budget process. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But to your point, Tom, you could take the thirteen thousand dollars and for that department and put it into the reserve. It's kind of like a contingency account, and then you could use it um, if if it were needed uh, in the following year. You could do that for another purpose other than parks and rec. Well, no, it would be reserved in the parks and rec. Okay, department. in parks and rec. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about too. What's there's a rule about transferring between only 10 was it 10 percent of the yeah across different budget lines okay. so yeah so we can't take like leftover public works money and give it to steve pixley right and yeah because i guess only 10 percent we could 10 that's no that's a good point because the budget is approved by voters for these different right. items you we have to stick to as close the category that, that they were approved any for. Kind of a, no, I know. I, you um, just gave a good just, opportunity to explain okay. it. That's a good point. Yeah. So do we have an idea? Sorry. Do we have an idea of the aging of those carry forwards? You mean for each individual one, like yeah. how? Yeah. So how, how long? long how so long we've been carrying? We've been carrying them. them. I would say that the one that kind of jumps out at me, the rest of you know, the ones that are um, for like the capital improvement projects. Um, some of them, you know, it's been several years now and, you know, we're trying to address that by, um, you know, sort of budgeting differently for our capital improvements. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we talked about um, instead of, you know, CIPs that we know that are going to span multiple financial years, creating a reserve account for those instead of automatically creating a CIP for them. CIP um, is a capital improvement project. Yeah, sorry for using acronyms. Um, so I think, you know, but that's more of a going forward thing so that we aren't carrying hundreds of thousands of dollars forward yeah. um, year in and year out. For the, I guess for the others that are on the list here. Well, there was, um, there was, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry, the, the more departmental ones, the ones that aren't um, capital in nature. Yep. I would say that there's only a couple that jump out as mm -hmm. ones that... Um, have been carried forward longer than just this financial year. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one in the general government, it's the marketing mm -hmm. budget. That's, that's definitely sort of accumulated to a pretty large sum and it's been carried forward for a few different financial years and I'd have to go look back to see mm -hmm. Which ones? But What's um, the definition of marketing in this context, brochures, website redesign and stuff. So that that's what's proposed for. That's that's yeah. how. That's the reason proposed for carrying it forward. But is marketing bigger than just? That's like a budget line in our. Yeah. So I I think when it was created, it used to like run ads all over the place well, <laughs> to promote Camden. And created. Get that's on kind lists, of what it was. I didn't care for. Well, for at the time. Too. What? Newsletters too. Well, the newsletters were marketing. That's marketing. So it was just like the basic town I newsletter, guess, which I really think we should get back in the habit of doing. Agreed. But, yes, but there was actual marketing that was going on. That it was like, yeah, how to get you know top ten places to there, go to the or, beach or retire. Are, we paid to be on a lot of those things. Just yes. to point out, there are three mega buckets here. The last bucket is probably the easiest one, which is a, a small shred. The third one, that is a recommendation to your point, Tom, about transferring a total of 300 and no 282 whatever the number is a thousand dollars transferring it from uh, carry forward to reserves that's the third spreadsheet where's oh, the third what's the, the third, third the spreadsheet? Last spreadsheet in oh, the, the transfer to reserves yeah. yes so that amount that chunk of monies which is over a quarter million dollars is being recommended to be transferred for example uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the ICMA uh, MPERS amount, $2,000 transferred to public safety reserve. So it's being put in the reserve for that department, so it could be used for that or something else later. But that, to that, that, that is one action we, we need to consider. The other two are, are, are actual carry forwards. One is wastewater, which is wastewater commissioners, we should be looking at that, but um, that's $228,000. and. Uh, and no recommendation for any transfers there. And then the big, the first one, the biggie, 1.377 million. That one is also, as it currently stands, doesn't have any recommendations except 
Audra is maybe, I'm hearing, recommending the 34,874 marketing in the uh, professional, uh, is that professional General services? government. General government, yeah, is it may be one we could possibly transfer it to reserve. Is there any others, Audra? Um, I would say that the, the dams, um, instead of, you know, um, carrying forward into the operational. This is in wastewater? No, no, no this dams. is in the. In um, the first spreadsheet. First spreadsheet. In culture and recreation. Oh, I see. We have um, reserve accounts for that purpose as well. So that. I, that could be transferred to the reserve accounts for the dams maintenance. Mm -hmm. So. But I guess my, my, my more, so I'm, I'm not opposed to carrying forward in, in, as a general accounting principle. My question is, I would like to see plans to actually spend down those carry forwards because these are things that need to happen, right? Mm -hmm. All of them well, necessarily. necessarily. I mean, how much more marketing do we need to do? I don't know. Well, if that account has been languishing at thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars for two so, years, so let's don't, get don't bother. But so, so that's why. I'm, okay, so I agree with you. I don't understand which ones I need to put in reserve. That's the problem. And which ones, you know, like the I and I study, I know we're going to finish it. Well, right? I would say so, so I'd say you can assume everything on these spreadsheets that they're they're recommending unless there's something saying transfer to reserve, they're recommending you just carry it forward into that same line so item. Right, that's the way I'm reading. I'm sorry. Yes. The department had saying that they need it to do something else. Yes. yes. That didn't get finished yeah. and yeah. And or or they're needing you know they um, recognize now with what they have budgeted that it would be helpful to have the, those additional funds to cover something like with the um, you know the contract that we have with the YMCA for the right. summer rec program. Right. 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 That that I understand. Okay. So the one point three seven seven million and change, the only item you could possibly debate is thirty four thousand. It's kind of chump change in the total. Yeah, and I mean, and it's, it's not even you could you could just carry it forward into that. Um, operational line if you want. You don't have to yeah. go with the recommendation to put it in a reserve. It, um, okay. Or like, reserve would you put it in? Just the general economic development reserve. To, to access a reserve, the department head has to come to the select board? Yes. Okay. Yep. When it's not there. Yep. yep. Um, so the economic development reserve, I guess I don't know about that one. <laughs> There are just so there's so many. Oh, the, the list of reserves make your head spin. Yeah, there's there a lot. Communications reserve. Uh, I can we get those newsletters we back. Can, we can make or like, one. <laughs> I, I guess you know, to, to get back to substance, um, we have a couple of choices. We can first take the first spreadsheet of the one with the one point. The recommended from most of the monies is in debt capital contingency, and that is one point two. Uh, Two, three is that number? Yeah, yeah, 1.2, uh, one and a quarter million dollars. That's, that's projects. Um, yeah. and, and I doubt we're gonna be moving any of those around. So the, the delta between that and 1.377 is $140,000, which is this miscellaneous stuff. So, you know, you, you're really not playing with a lot here. And no. my recommendation was just to stick with the 1.377 and carry forward. I. I mean, I just don't think it's we, we, unless unless we Audra felt strongly about any account, but I'm not hearing that. No, I, I think it probably make it more complicated at this so point. Too. So, so I would look to motion to at least the first motion to accept the total general fund carryover of one million three seventy seven one ninety one. So moved. I'm just curious, one three seven seven. What is the, second oh, that, for a purpose of discussion? Second for purpose. You have to you keep jumping ahead. I'm going to discipline you again. No, what are your questions? Again. <laughs> I'm unruly. Oh my minute. word. I yes, I, I, we, we second. I, I yes. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Thank you. One point three million dollars. What is the proportion of our annual town budget? Oh. You know what I mean? Hmm, approximately uh, nine point so, seven. I was going to say almost 10%. 9.7. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's not unconfidential. Good job, guys. <laughs> no, but no, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the budget. No, no, I yeah. know it's in the budget, but it means that there's 10% of money that we're not acting no, no, on. No, I kind of disagree with you because if you, if one, point, one and a quarter million of that amount is capital projects that haven't been finished. So, like the seawall, for instance, there's, that's not enough money so to rebuild the seawall. Okay. So. No way. 
but we want to keep it there for when we rebuild the seawall. Right. Right. Or, or I guess like, you know, the, the pumper right. truck, it's a, you know, expensive piece of equipment that we've already ordered. Um, <laughs> for it. We haven't paid for it because okay. we haven't received, we haven't received it, yet. it yet. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess your point, yeah, yeah. But really, what your point, Sophie, the amount we're looking at is more, what is the total? It's uh, uh, $70,710. Right, right, I get it. The general government. And I and it's a, it's a good point though, Sophie, and that's it's it something that, you know, Jody and I have talked a lot about how the way that we've budgeted in the past, like um, to give you an example, so the first year that I started, in the in the budget that I sort of came here with and that Bob and Allison came here with as well, it had um, the uh, Route 1 North sidewalk, pro or sorry, Route 1 South is what they call it. Right. Route 1 South sidewalk project was budgeted and it was a CIP for that year as well as the um, the Washington Street sidewalk Route from Matthew. South. Oh, yeah. toward yeah. okay. Yeah. One that's being yeah. done now. Yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, that was, when I first started, that was a CIP for five, that year. Five years ago. So for five years, we've had to carry, carry it forward, forward as a CIP. So what Jody and I have talked about is when you have a project like that, where you know that there's going to be multiple years of planning and, right. you know, design and engineering, and then, you know, you, you bid it out and you find out that it's like twice the cost of what you budgeted in FY18 or whenever. A better way to do it, and what we're trying to do now, is create reserve accounts for these multi-year projects Absolutely. so that we can keep coming back to them and we don't have to carry forward this money year in and year out. So we're trying to be better about that and the only things that we'll put in as a CIP are piece of, uh, pieces of equipment that we can buy that financial year or the project once we actually have everything done and it's ready to go, pulling it out of reserve and putting it into a, a CIP. So a quick color coding of this, for instance, would help like you know, yes. next, next time we look at them so that we know this is a carry forward, this goes to reserve, this is going to be, w this truck hasn't been delivered yet. I think that would just help mm -hmm. with, you know, speed. So I have a motion and second any further discussion. All those in favor? Five zero. Now to the second spreadsheet, which is really wastewater, so make believe we're wastewater commissioners, we have 228,481. Are there any comments on these? No. no. So I need a motion for that to be um, carried um, forward. I make a motion that we carry forward two hundred twenty thousand, two hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars for, four hundred eighty-one dollars. Sorry. Correct. To the, budget, to the FY twenty-three budget. So, can I make a quick point with this, just for Tom and Stephanie's benefit? Sure. So your role as wastewater commissioners is a little different than your role as select board members. Your your powers are more similar to that of like a city council. So, this. Um, the surplus or the unassigned balance for the wastewater fund is separate than the general fund budget. So if you were to let this money lapse into a surplus, you still have the authority to decide how that's spent it's and it different. doesn't need to go back to voters. Right. Because it's you, the select board, approves the wastewater and the snowball budgets. It doesn't have to go to oh, voters. It doesn't go to voters. That's correct. Good it's point. not in a town budget. That's a good point. So One this of the few areas we have more power. That's correct. There are wastewater. Wastewater, yeah. yeah three major buckets we discussed. The general fund, which is a whole town. Wastewater, separate. Special project, doesn't get voted on. Uh, and Snowball, special project, doesn't get voted on either. So this wastewater thing is, uh, is, is, is we have a lot more flexibility with this one in a sense. But, but should we vote as wastewater, wastewater commissioners? <laughs> well, they don't have to do that anymore. They changed the charter oh, so that you charter, don't. So we yeah. don't have to. Right. That's right. Uh, Thank you. You're the only one that has to be a wastewater commissioner. Do we still but, get our wastewater commissioner stipend? Yes. Yeah. You get $1,500 as a select board member and $500 as a wastewater commissioner per year. And I accept donations. I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry. So I made a motion. You, you, and, and Was it second? Have a second? I didn't hear a second. I didn't hear a second. I'll second. Okay, motion made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. And lastly, now this one is you know, the little, the little one, which is for the amount of two eighty two six seventy five. Now this one, all of these are being transferred to the respective reserves, as note annotated in the spreadsheet. I make a motion that we approve all the transfers to the reserve in the amount of two hundred eighty-two thousand dollars six hundred seventy-five. Correct. Second. 
Second. Tom, thank you. Further discussion? All in favor? All five, thank you very much. And not, that kind of completes that item finally. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it three times. Uh, back to select board reports. Stephanie, did you want to add anything at select board report level? Nope. Mr. Tom Hedstrom? No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Bob? No, 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 I can't go next. So this is Sophie. <laughs> So, um, yeah, just uh, a couple things. Uh, the first one is that we, Bob and I attended a meeting of the investment committee uh, mm -hmm. to look at the status of the trust funds. And uh, it was very informative. And I think we have a very healthy trust fund as it is with good strategy moving forward to keep, you know, to preserve and to protect basically the increase that we've seen over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have to revisit this until the fall. And we do it at least two or three times a year. Two or three year. times yeah. a year, so depending, we're gonna. Depending. Maybe more, the market's rather volatile right now, and of course the trust funds aren't yep. where they were six months ago. Uh, nobody's uh, portfolios are there. The yep. general market is down, what, 15? Nine, so the, yeah, and the forecast is to be, I think, 19% 19% down, well, yeah. but the, our inv investment firm who manages those invest those portfolios is doing a little bit better than the market right now. So right. that's reassuring. Right. But it's something to keep an eye on. You guys will start getting, if you haven't already, have you gotten the stuff in the mail? I always find it, I found it like kind of strange that as soon as I got elected to the select board, the investment company already knew and I would get, you know, you get it mailed like this big packet to your house and I yeah, know, but I've kind of, I've kind right of, on top of that. I've uh, kind of admonished them to send it to the town rather than homes. Yeah, but, uh, I'm still getting mine. No, that's fine. You're welcome I'm, to have it. I, I don't. I get mine here. Oh. But anyway, it's it's just what it is. But yeah, you can so you, can, you can review the portfolio and you know see what's going on and what its performance is for. The how many trusts is it? Seven, nine. Well, the big issue, though, is that no matter. It, I, and I'm glad that you brought this up, Sophie. And since you're on the trust fund committee. Now, too, right. what they don't do a good job of is separating out, um, like, it's, it, we have some of those um, funds that are not no, associated no. with, the, with the, um, the funds that we use for general assistance type things. Mm -hmm. And so seeing it all separate. Well, you, want it, you want a lump so that, fund? Would you like so to that you can see, fund? like, these are the... Yeah, the, this is we what we've that. used. We can do that. Um, we can do that by fund, yeah. By so fund, can, no, because yeah. the because oh, the yeah. trust funds continue the ones that are supposed to be used to help people. Yeah. Yep, you know, yep, they continue yep, to yep. grow, yep. and we're All only right. allowed to use the interest. But that's the well, we, we have the opposite that. problem. We're spending like way way less than we ever generate in interest. So that's true. there yeah. is a real opportunity to be able to help yep. more people. Um, the stipulation is. The, the biggest fund is the most broadly worded, which is for the poor and unfortunate residents of Camden. Right. Um, it's the Charles Wood Fund. It started in around 1950, right. and so some of the language is a little antiquated. But it does, um, you know, for yeah. the trust fund committee reviews it, and it's just something for, yeah, just, for you guys uh, to you know, keep in mind. We that can, um, We can break those out by trust we fund. Should. We do it a lot just by, we fund our own general assistance program, yeah. and so we do a lot of like helping people that come in and needing temporary housing or whatever. But there's also, we're trying to make an effort also to look for opportunities to fund organizations that are doing, you know, that's like, you know, food pantries and, and things like that, or if somebody's building These, a homeless um, shelter yeah. so that the town's not, we're not really all that, right. we don't have the bandwidth to be handing out $100 here and $100 there. It'd be better to right. kind of well, help the organization to, to probably. Tom and Stephanie's benefit, these, these funds, when I joined the select board, we joined the select board in many years ago. Um, <laughs> The funds were in the order of two, two and a half million. Today, they are June thirtieth. They are at six point one. Six point one. Yeah. But <laughs> at twelve thirty one twenty one, they were at seven million. So the market has hit us a little bit. But the overall, uh, the overall um, performance has been good. And, it, and that's a summary of all of the X number of trusts. The town, they're as small as 20,000, as large as, mm -hmm. as the Woods Fund, which is a multi million. Um, and but they total and they're they're an in perpetuity kind of investments where we allocate to stock versus fixed income versus you know, but then the there's various. some that are just like the, the Midco Solid Waste Closure that, Fund that, and the things separate, that are that's not that's 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 separate. separate. I want to see all of that separated no, out, but that's no, but the Midco's separate. the Midco's closure, separate, but the ones from the, the town, like. 
Yeah, the different ones we can, we can I mean, yeah, by fund. By fund, it would be interesting. We're just looking at the general health and the st st strategy right. that the, our investment manager is, is adopting know, and, and making sure. I'm, I, I agree with you; it would be helpful, and we can we can ask easily. we can ask him to do. That. I'll actually I'll, I'll ask Mike to do that. I'll take care of that Matt, since yeah. I'm. The um, but I think one of the um, um, I, I think that's you know uh, important to break it down by fund because they did the magnitude of funds is dramatically different. Because yeah. we're and, trying to have a sense of you know how much should we be. Right. Spending for a year. I mean, it's a little bit em embarrassing how underspent it is. Yep. Sometimes yeah, I, they I would, don't. I would agree. You don't want to broadcast it out to the world. Hey, there's all this money, but Especially at some don't point, broadcast you know, there are people in Camden that that need help, and well, total, if you're willing to provide income information and to, you know, total total withdrawals. There is a lot of ability to help people. Well, I think last year's total total withdrawals was only about 150, 170 thousand dollars. And that was a a, that was a great year because you, yep. you know I think like the first year I started it was like twenty three thousand right. dollars. So it, we're it, making and, an effort. And, and lastly, there is an IPS investment policy statement yeah. that is approved so every so often by the select board in terms of it specifies how the financial advisor is, is um, evaluated. You know uh, how much they are allowed to charge us for fees, and also, um, uh, you know, also what the investment strategy is because we don't allow unlimited, uh, you know, investment in equities because it can be volatile. And we spent that's all in, in an IPS. If you're interested, we can get you a copy of it. Yeah. Some people might not think the town should be heavily invested in Dunkin' Donuts, right? Seeing that we try didn't want them to be here, but right. but we are. Um, I, I still can't find that. We, we're anyway. in, we're in it's just like you look at you yeah. look at the stuff we're invested in. And it's like, oh, oh, interesting. That's anyway, like all um, the people of Camden rally. One battle at a time. No, I'm going to stop here. One battle at a time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, nope. I think I've already used up enough time. But you, thank you, you for the really? opportunity. You can save it for reserve for next time. Yeah. yeah, I have I to feel the same. I reserve I, the remainder of my time for some oh, future no, occasion. Something, actually, uh, something else. I'm sorry. Uh, we had the kickoff call with Audra and uh, and Forrest Bell. Oh. With Forrest Bell and Maggie. I think that's important. That was my number two. So we're we're finalizing the contract. I think this week, Audra, because mm -hmm. she, I was remiss. I need to give her one last piece of information. One consultant. The River Consultants and. River um, consultant. yes. That was nice how you. Can, he said, "Damn, consultant, and you're right." Are, are you uh, are you unruly? No, I, no, yeah, I am. I'm <laughs> learning from you. I'm you. learning from you. <laughs> Keep no. Go ahead. Keep continuing. Um, anyway, so so and they're going to submit a revised work plan uh, because to take into account the the date we're going to be starting at. But I think we had a really good conversation, um, and we're going to continue the conversation. We have different touch points with them along the course of their engagement with us. Um, and uh, we're going to also, Alison has volunteered to give them a lot of information that mm -hmm. she's had. So it's started. Sounds great. Now I'm really done. Really? Okay, good. Um, only minor thing, just a reminder, we have a workshop on Thursday, 1 o'clock, and I propose that to be in order of about an hour. Um, there's data you have, a packet you have. Let's hope that'll uh, make the meeting somewhat more efficient, but we'll Which see. Is the to what topic is that one? The, uh, the, um, you would ask. Oh, okay. It's the moratorium on uh, on peers, docks, okay. and folks. Okay, yep. yep. That's on Thursday at 1. I've got one thing. So I jumped right past you. <laughs> I'm not used <laughs> I'm to you being here. What's that? I already asked them. Oh, you did. I'm oh, sorry. Or actually, no, I have two things. Oh. Um, so just to give everyone a heads up, I met with um, down uh, a downtown property owner. They own a few buildings who received um, the letters about their license being revoked mm -hmm. and parking. they uh, parking but they they also um, address the fact that one of the licenses covers uh, their ability to have decks off the back of their buildings so they can access them mm -hmm. so I said that what what we could do is just write up a new license agreement that would sort of protect yep. their ability to have those um, or to keep those decks there um, so once you know we've got that drafted, um, I I can bring that to the select board to have a look at it. I, we're going to go back and forth with the property owners a little bit on that, and there's a couple of them. So um, we're going to be working on that pretty soon. Um, another thing, I'm going to. Does everybody know what we're talking about? Do you, do you guys not. know? Because this was not. Oh, uh, this isn't right. obvious to most people that mm -hmm. that the area of the public yeah, landing. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. That's. Um, most people that kind of there's like a little private parking area on the public landing and then when you go down the walkway 
to the left, it's like grassy and there's like the landscaping is a little nicer than the rest of it. And so that was an agreement mm -hmm. back started like 1990s even before that where yeah. I think it was at a time when the public landing wasn't as popular that those building owners um, had an agreement with the town where they would do the landscaping there and in return they got to have I think it was six um, split up between them six private parking spaces um, and so what was it a few months ago um, um, it was actually about three and a half months ago okay a few. Um, I don't know, that's not a few to me. It was, that's uh, yeah. It was a long time ago, but anyway, go ahead. Okay. That was, that's, that's basically it. it. We, vote, we talked about, um, right. about ending those agreements so that that space could be reclaimed as, um, I don't, there's no plan for it yet, but the, the agreements require a 90-day notice. Um, so we voted at that point to end correct. the That's correct. end the agreement so that we could at least have it on the table to to use that space for mm -hmm. public space um, but it's interesting because a lot of people really don't know that it's they don't that it is public space um, there so mm -hmm. with that um, I got oh, one more one thing. more I forgot your second one <laughs> so for the priorities workshop I'm putting together a packet of information to send out to everyone and that'll include you know sort of the list of current projects yep. um, you know the the capital plan as well as the debt schedule um, and also you know all the um, you know past years priority setting and what what came out of that and sort of great um, grouping everything by the uh, priorities and goals identified by the select board over the past few years and the projects that have been uh, progressed in service of those goals. So you just have all that background information. That's great. Thanks, Audra. That'll help a lot. Because yeah. that's in August something. I forget. Yeah, I, I figured though there's a lot of information. So giving, you know, doing that and giving it out to everyone ahead of time so that if anybody has any questions, and we set we that time. date without your involvement. So August we, 2nd, right? I, you would ask. Um, uh, just in case there's a problem with it, uh, let no, us know. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. That works. You're right, with that, <laughs> I would request a motion to adjourn. Make a motion we adjourn the select board. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Like you want to continue? Uh, all those in favor? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Appreciate it.